Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Martin Gregory. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Mr. Martin, what brings you here today? Oh well, I had a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty surgery on my right shoulder six weeks ago, and I have a sling for the past four weeks. I've just been doing what the home health people tell me. I just can't lift anything. I have no shoulder hypoextension, and I just need to rehabilitate from that surgery. So, you said that you can't lift things right now. How about like, what things does your shoulder keep you from doing that you'd like to do? Ah. Well, pretty much anything is difficult. I can't hold anything that's heavier than a coffee cup, and I can't support my own body weight. I can't drive, and I can't really do many outdoor things like, go fishing with my grandson and stuff. I also like to play catch with him. But, I'm right-handed, and my shoulder hasn't allowed me to do that, since I had my surgery. To be honest, I was having a tough time doing that beforehand. Are there any other issues you face, due to your shoulder, such as opening doors? Or while navigating through your house? Well, as long as I can do with my left shoulder, that's fine. But while doing anything, I just have kept my shoulder right here in the sling for most of the time. So I can't really do anything with that like, putting on a shirt, and things are hard when you have to brush your teeth left-handed. It's kind of weird, as you don't do it often. Yeah, I understand Mr. Martin, that's hard. Well, I know you've had the surgery. Have you had anything else in your past, like a medical history? 15 years ago I had a rotator cuff repair. I have played a lot of tennis in high school, and in college, and I think doing all of that really put a lot of stress on my shoulder. So I had surgery on that, and then the past year, I have had increased pain, weakness and loss of range of motion in the shoulder here. Now, I want to know more about your past. Do you drink? I have a beer every once in a while. Okay. How many times a week do you drink? I just have a couple on Saturdays. Okay. Do you smoke cigarettes? I don't. I used to but not anymore. Okay, I'd also like to go through some other details, just to make sure everything else is fine. Have you had any history, or currently any problems with your heart? I do have hypertension but I take medication and that seems to take care of it. What medications are you taking right now? I'm taking two medications with some goofy names, NSAIDs and Tenormin. Okay, those are anti-inflammatory drugs. How often you take them? Well. I'm supposed to take NSAIDs, one a day for pain, and to Norman, I think twice a day. Do you live with your family? Yes, with my wife Gretchen. What is your occupation? I was a school teacher for 28 years. So now, I mostly do stuff for leisure. Okay, how much did you exercise before the surgery? You know I tried to get out and we have a little Dax hunt, so I would get out and walk him every morning. I take him down to the high school, that's down from the house and we do about a half mile on the track every day. It helps to kind of keep me limber. Yeah, that's pretty good exercise. Now that you are moving a little bit, what do you think the pain is at right now? On a scale from 0 being no pain, 10 being the worst possible pain imaginable. It kind of fluctuates. But, I would say most of the time, it's right around 4. Okay, and does it ever get worse? Ah, uh, in the mornings, it's a little stiff, and that's probably the most painful. Sometimes, 
if I roll over in my sleep, and that doesn't feel very good. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient called Naomi Myers. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello Naomi. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. My name is Erin Kaminsky. I'm the registered dietitian here, and I understand that you were brought to me after a doctor's appointment that you've had. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. Do you mind explaining to me how that appointment got you here today? Yeah, sure. I went to the doctors last week and we had done some tests and found out that I have very high cholesterol, and so I have an appointment with you today, because I would like to weigh out some of my options as opposed to immediately going on medication. Okay, great. So we'll just get started by asking a few questions. What do you generally do to start off your typical weekday? Well, depending on what day the week it is I wake up between 6.30 and 7.30 in the morning. First thing I do is take a shower, brush my teeth, make a pot of coffee, get dressed and usually after that I start my workday. Alright, and what do you do for a living? I have three jobs. On Mondays and Tuesdays, I do toxicology at County Medical Examiner's Office for postmortem there. The rest of the week, I work as a lab technician at Belmont's Hospital. After an eight-hour shift each day, I go straight to Ruby in downtown, where I work as a bartender and a server. Wow! So you definitely are keeping busy throughout the week. Do you think during all these busy work hours you had time for meals? I do. I don't eat breakfast. It usually doesn't make me feel too well. I have my coffee as my breakfast. There's a lot of fast food places that I go to in between going to jobs or on my lunch break, like Taco Bell, Burger King. There's also a subway next to one of my jobs. Usually when I get home from work, especially if I'm at Ruby, I'm always really hungry. So I'll grab some ice cream from Friendly's. Okay and on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most stressful. Do you find yourself stressed working all these hours? I would say, on a scale of 1 to 10, definitely close to a 10, around a 9. Okay. So, you're stressed out. And do you think that has effect on your eating habits? Having ice cream after a long day, definitely makes me feel better at the end of the day. But I don't think the stress has too much influence on my diet. Okay, all right. So, do you live with anyone at home? I am currently living with my boyfriend. All right. Is there any type of exercise going on throughout all these busy days of yours? I used to run on the treadmill before I accumulated all my jobs but now I don't really find the time. All right. Does anyone in your family have e high cholesterol as well? My dad is on medication for high cholesterol and a lot of his siblings have high cholesterol. So, it's kind of in the family? Oh yes. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a physician explaining about the treatments for major depressive disorder. Now read the question. Oh. 
A major depressive disorder is one of the most severe, troublesome, and costly psychiatric diseases. Although there are pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments, often antidepressants are used more frequently than psychological interventions due to inadequate resources. Our efforts are to promote the evidence-based prescription of these antidepressants in the future. Therefore, we are now focused to update and expand our previous efforts to compare and categorize antidepressants for treating a major depressive disorder. All antidepressants were more efficacious compared with placebos while treating the adults with a major depressive disorder. While the effect was lesser in the placebo-controlled patients, the variation in efficacy and acceptability was more in the patients treated with antidepressants. Therefore, these findings should promote the evidence-based prescription of antidepressants and apprise the physicians, patients, and policymakers on the merits of various antidepressants. One of the most crucial challenges worldwide is the routine prescription of antidepressants for the treatment of a major depressive disorder. Nevertheless, in the scientific literature, there are considerable ongoing debates about the effectiveness of antidepressants as well as the potential differences in tolerance and effectiveness due to individual drugs. With the introduction of new antidepressants into the market and the increasing numbers of trials published every year, we have realized the significance of systematic review and meta-analysis to synthesize the evidence in this crucial clinical issue. Question 26. You hear a nurse briefing, a colleague at the end of her shift. Now read the question. Okay, so the next thing is about Susie Williams in bed three. Right. She's been admitted for chest pain to rule out MI. Mm -hmm. So far, she had an EKG, which was okay. And the first set of cardiac enzymes and troponins are negative. Mm. When she came in, her blood pressure was elevated a little, like 182 over 95. But she was given Lozartan, and at 6 o'clock, it was 142 over 82. Mm -hmm. She was also dehydrated, so we started her on IV fluids. D5, half normal saline, running at 125 millilitres. Yeah. That can go until midnight and then it can be disconnected. Mm -hmm. She's scheduled for a stress test tomorrow and some more enzyme tests. Okay? Okay. Question 27. You hear a dietitian talking to a patient. Now read the question. So what seems to be the problem? I feel such a failure. I'm sure people think that if I just tried harder, I could lose weight. Maybe I need more willpower. Well, firstly, well done for seeking medical help. Actually, being overweight or obese is a medical problem, because being overweight changes how your body works. Oh, thanks, but I do feel that it's my fault for being this way. Well, I hear what you say, but please understand that these days we consider that obesity is a disease, mm. like high blood pressure or asthma. You see, the body's signals to the brain stop working correctly when you're overweight, and with time you feel less full, even if you eat the same amount. And when you cut calories, your body tries to use less energy to keep your weight the same. Question 28. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about lupus disease. Now read the question. Lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease in which the immune system becomes hyperactive and attacks healthy tissue, resulting in such as inflammation, swelling, and damage to skin, joints, blood, kidneys, the heart, and lungs. 
Normally, our immune system makes proteins called antibodies to protect and fight against antigens such as bacteria and viruses. However, lupus makes the immune system unable to differentiate between the healthy tissue and antigens, which leads the immune system to direct antibodies against the healthy tissue instead of antigens. Question 29. You hear a consultant talking to a trainee about a patient's eye condition. Now read the question. Have we got uh, Mrs. Kent's notes? Yes, they're here. She's coming in today for possible laser surgery for her retinopathy, isn't she? Well, depending on results. And from the look of these pictures we took last time, there's been a slow improvement. So we'll talk to her, and perhaps hold off for the time being. Unless her condition's worsened, because it can in some cases. So what's the cause? Well, we know a leak of fluid behind the retina causes the distorted vision which sufferers get. But not why that occurs. There may be a link with stress, and also steroid use, but the jury's still out, I'm afraid. Question 30. You hear part of a hospital management meeting where a concern is being discussed. Now read the question. Now I'll hand over to Jenny, who has a few words to say about staffing. Jenny? Thanks. Now, if we compare ourselves to other hospitals of the same size in other regions, we're actually recording lower rates of staff turnover. That's just as well, given the challenges filling vacant positions across the sector. Where we do compare unfavorably is in the number of days lost to sick leave. That's making it hard to maintain full cover on the wards, and we all know the costs of that. As a matter of urgency, then, HR looking into the worst affected areas to understand the reasons behind it and to see if there's anything we can do to help and support the staff involved. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a psychiatrist called Dr. Anthony Gibbons giving a presentation about the role of case stories in medicine. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, my name's Anthony Gibbons. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and published author. I'd like to talk about something that's relevant to all medical professionals, the use of narratives in medicine. Let me begin with a case study sent to me by a colleague who shares my interest in the subject. The study featured a 30-year-old man who was hospitalised for severe panic attacks. He was treated with narcoanalysis, but, feeling no relief, turned to alcohol and endured years of depression and social isolation. Four decades later, he was back in the psychiatric system, but for the first time he was prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. Six weeks later, he was discharged because the panic attacks and depression had disappeared. He lived a full life until his death 19 years later. If the narrative was striking, it was even more so for its inclusion in a medical journal. Repeatedly, I've been surprised by the impact that even lightly sketched case histories can have on readers. In my first book, I wrote about personality and how it might change on medication. My second was concerned with theories of intimacy. Readers, however, often use the books for a different purpose identifying depression. Regularly, I received and still receive phone calls, people saying, my husband's just like X, one figure from a clinical example. Other readers wrote to say that they'd recognised themselves. Seeing that they weren't alone gave them hope. Encouragement is another benefit of case description, familiar to us in an age when everyone's writing their biography. But, This isn't to say that stories are a panacea to issues inherent in treating patients, and there can be disadvantages. Consider my experience prescribing Prozac. When certain patients reported feeling better than well after receiving it, I presented these examples first in essays for psychiatrists and then in my book, where I surrounded the narrative material with accounts of research. In time, my loosely supported descriptions led others to do controlled trials that confirmed the phenomenon. But doctors hadn't waited for those controlled trials. In advance, the better-than-well hypothesis had served as a tentative fact. Treating depression, colleagues looked out for personality change, even aimed for it, even though this wasn't my intended outcome. This brings me to my next point. Often, the knowledge that informs clinical decisions emerges when you stand back from it, like an impressionist painting. What initially seems like randomly scattered information begins to come together, and what you see is the bigger picture. That's where the true worth of anecdote lies, beyond its role as illustration hypothesis builder and low-level guidance for practice. Storytelling can act as a modest counterbalance to a narrow focus on data. If we rely solely on evidence, we risk moving toward a monoculture, whereby patients and their afflictions become reduced to inanimate objects, a result I'd consider unfortunate, since there are many ways to influence people for the better. It's been my hope that, while we wait for conclusive science, stories will preserve diversity in our theories of mind. My recent reading of outcome trials of antidepressants has strengthened my suspicion that the line between research and storytelling can be fuzzy. In medicine, randomised trials are rarely large enough to provide guidance on their own. Statisticians amalgamate many studies through a technique called meta-analysis. The first step of the process, deciding which data to include, colours the findings. Effectively, the numbers are narrative. Put simply, evidence-based medicine is judgement-based medicine in which randomised trials are carefully assessed and given their due. I don't think we need to be embarrassed about this. Our substantial formal findings require integration. The danger is in pretending otherwise. I've long felt isolated in embracing the use of narratives in medicine, which is why I warm to the likelihood of narratives being used to inform future medical judgments. It would be unfortunate if medicine moved fully to squeeze the art out of its science by marginalising the narrative. Stories aren't just better at capturing the bigger picture, but the smaller picture too. I'm thinking of the article about the depressed man given the drug Zoloft. The degree of transformation in the patient was just as impressive as the length of observation. No formal research can offer a 40-year lead-in or a 19-year follow-up. Few studies report on both symptoms and social progress. 
research reduces information about many people. Narratives retain the texture of life in all its forms. We need storytelling, which is why I'll keep harping on about it until the message gets through. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of Dr. Thaddeus Roxby giving a lecture on the types of eczema. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Eczema is not a single health condition. It is a recognizable reaction method seen in a number of skin diseases. Atopic dermatitis is a common cause of eczema that is more prevalent in the patients with asthma and hay fever. The signs and symptoms of eczema include tiny blisters or vesicles that can weep and ooze, eventually producing crusted, thickened plaques of skin. It is always quite itchy. It is significant to distinguish the different causes of eczema, as the effective treatments will also differ. Eczema starts as red, raised, tiny blisters containing a clear fluid atop red, elevated plaques, and when these blisters break, the affected skin starts to weep and ooze. In chronic eczema, the blisters are less prominent and the skin is elevated, thickened, and scaling. There are about 11 distinct types of skin conditions that produce eczema. Atopic dermatitis tends to begin early in life with those with a predisposition to influent allergies, but it probably does not have an allergic basis. Characteristically, rashes occur on the cheeks, neck, elbow, and knee creases, and ankles. Irritant dermatitis occurs when the skin is repeatedly exposed to toxic substances or due to excessive washing. Allergic contact dermatitis occurs after repeated exposures to the same allergic substance. The immune recognition system becomes activated at the site of the next exposure and produces a dermatitis. Poison ivy allergy is a good example of allergic contact dermatitis. Stasis dermatitis commonly occurs on the swollen lower legs of patients who have poor blood circulation in the veins of the legs. Fungal infections can produce a pattern similar to many other types of eczema. However, the fungus can be visualized with a scraping under the microscope or grown in culture. Scabies is caused by an infestation by the human itch mite and produces a rash very similar to other forms of eczema. Pomphylix or dyshydriotic eczema is very common and affects the hands and occasionally the feet by creating an itchy rash composed of tiny blisters on the sides of the fingers or toes and palms or soles. Lichen simplex chronicus produces thickened plaques of skin commonly found on the shins and neck. 
Numular eczema is a non-specific term for coin-shaped plaques of scaling skin, most often on the lower legs of aged persons. In the xerotic eczema, the skin will crack and ooze due to excessive dryness. Sybaretic dermatitis produces a rash on the scalp, face, ears, and occasionally the mid-chest in adults. In infants, it produces a weepy, oozy rash behind the ears and are often quite extensive, involving the entire body. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.